I don't care if it's the Chinese, the Russians, or my goddamn next door neighbor. If they know we're communicating in the open field, encryption or not, it's not good enough. If the communications are encrypted, it shouldn't matter, right? End-to-end -end encryption is not the problem at this point. I know our encryption is good. We have field agents that need to be able to access resources on the public internet for various operations. If anyone, adversary or not, can discern an intelligence asset is doing anything on the public internet at all, encryption or not, it's no good. We're talking about the public internet though. Is that even possible? The field operators need to be invisible, indiscernible from the masses. If someone happens to come across the source of a field operative's traffic, it should be impossible to discern the destination and vice versa. Now I know it's challenging, but it can be done. This isn't Walmart, boys and girls. We're talking about national security in the greatest country this world has ever seen. Now use those big SIGINT brains of yours and start thinking outside the goddamn box. Enlist outside help if you have to, I don't care at this point. You find someone, we'll fast track their clearance and hopefully get something done around this godforsaken place for once. Understood, sir. Eastern Europe is free. The Soviet Union itself is no more. The year was 1995, and the Cold War had officially ended just a few years prior. But new threats emerged as cyber operations capabilities continued to develop around the world. Intelligence agencies saw the open internet as a rich source of valuable information, but that came at a cost, as it was fraught with other nation states, bad actors, and cyber criminals. Field operatives required a way to access public information sources on missions without leaving digital footprints, as any traceable activity could jeopardize both the mission as well as national security. Concerned with securing its communications and cyberspace reconnaissance, the US Navy began searching for innovative solutions. They sought out expertise in cryptography, network security, and anonymous communication. In early May of 1995, the Navy reached out to the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, where they came across Paul Syverson, a distinguished mathematician and computer scientist specializing in logic and security protocols. Recognizing the Navy's urgent need, Syverson began assembling a team to tackle the problem of developing a method for truly anonymous, untraceable communication over the public internet. Syverson collaborated with Michael G. Reed and David M. Goldschlag, both computer scientists at the NRL with expertise in network security and cryptographic systems. Before the end of the year, the trio was exploring concepts that would allow for not just encrypted, but truly anonymous, untraceable communication over the public internet. The challenge was to design a system where both the sender and the receiver could interact without any observer being able to trace the entire communication path. That is, if the encrypted traffic to or from the field agent were to be observed, it would be impossible for any single entity to know both the origin and destination of the traffic. And by 1997, after much effort and collaboration, the solution they came up with was the concept of onion routing, which later became known as the onion router, or simply known today as Tor. The solution worked so well, by the early 2000s, the Navy made the decision to release Tor to the public. This was done in an effort to increase the user base of Tor, making it even more difficult for adversaries to distinguish government communications from civilian. The decision to release Tor came along with several unexpected consequences, one of which being the emergence of darknet marketplaces that exploited the anonymity of the Tor network. This facilitated criminal activities on an unprecedented scale, giving birth to a hidden economy of underground dark markets hidden in cyberspace, such as Silk Road, Agora, and Alpha Bay. These dark web marketplaces quickly grew into a multi-billion dollar industry, trading in everything from illicit drugs, to weapons, to stolen passports, and illicit goods and services. The Navy's creation, sparking a huge surge in cybercrime, eventually devolved into the multi-billion dollar dark web economy that exists today. But how does Tor actually work? Is it really, truly anonymous? Time for a super quick break. If you're enjoying the content so far, please turn on the notification bell for us. Remember, it's not just me producing these videos, but a whole team of people doing their absolute best. You turning on notifications would make us very happy. We appreciate you watching and back to the content. Before diving into the dark net market drama, we need to understand how the Tor network actually works at a low level. Anyone can use Tor today, and it's extremely easy to set up. To use the Tor network, you simply download, install, and open the Tor browser. Once you click connect, 
The Tor browser will then connect to a directory server to retrieve information about the Tor network. Tor directory servers maintain updated lists of active relay servers, or nodes, and other important information for establishing secure connections. There are three different types of Tor nodes existing within the Tor network. The entry relay, aka guard relay. This is the first relay your web traffic will pass through. Next is the middle relay, the second relay, which connects your traffic from the entry relay to the exit relay. And then finally, the exit relay. This is the last relay where your traffic exits the circuit and reaches its destination. It is important to note that if you're connecting to a normal site on the public clear net, an exit node is used. However, if you're connecting to an onion service, such as a darknet market, a second relay is used called a rendezvous point. For simplicity, I'm just gonna call the third node the exit node, but I will make a clear distinction with easy to understand graphics. As of right now, according to Tor metrics, there are currently about 5,000 entry nodes, 7,200 middle relays, and 2,200 exit nodes in the entire Tor network. After obtaining the list of relays from the directory server, the Tor browser on your computer will decide on a circuit or pathway through the Tor network to the destination. Your browser will create the circuit by selecting one random entry point, one random middle relay, and then one exit node or rendezvous point if you're communicating with a Tor service. After deciding on a circuit, the famous onion encryption process begins. The Tor browser will create three secure encrypted channels between itself and the three nodes in the circuit. Once the encrypted channels are established, three encryption keys or passwords are created and exchanged between each Tor node and your Tor browser. An entry node password, a middle node password, and an exit node password. Now this part is extremely important. Each node only knows its own password, but your Tor client, aka the Tor browser, knows all three passwords. These three passwords will be used to triple encrypt and triple decrypt traffic as it's sent and received from your Tor browser. It's important to note that by default, your browser will automatically rebuild a new circuit every 10 minutes. Repeatedly changing circuits makes it harder for adversaries to correlate network traffic and link user activities over time. It also minimizes the risk that a malicious relay, for example, controlled by the FBI, can observe a significant portion of any given user's traffic. And then finally, what the SIGINT officer was yelling about at the start of this video, due to the layered encryption, no single node understands the full circuit. That is, no single node knows both where the traffic originated from and the destination. Thanks to onion routing, the entry node only knows traffic came from the client and the next destination is the middle node. When the middle node receives the traffic and decrypts it, the only thing it knows is the traffic came from the entry node and the next destination is the exit node or the rendezvous point. It has no idea about the originating client or the ultimate destination of the cell. And then when the exit node receives the traffic from the middle node, decrypts its layer, the only thing it knows is that it came from the middle node and the destination address. It has zero knowledge of the entry node or the originating client. Even if a spy or bad actor controls one of the nodes and intercepts the traffic, they won't be able to determine the full circuit. And remember, the circuit changes every 10 minutes by default, so figuring out the path is already hard enough, let alone dealing with the actual encryption. Nearly a perfect solution, right? Well, you'll come to find that even the most advanced cybersecurity technologies can't protect those who fail to keep their own secrets. As the NSA puts it, with 2.5 million daily users, Tor is the king of high security, low latency, internet anonymity. While Tor successfully served the United States' need to provide anonymity for its field operatives, those running darknet markets on the Tor network haven't always been so fortunate. Many high-profile darknet market operatives have been discovered, arrested, imprisoned, and in some cases wound up getting unalived, despite Tor's strong anonymity features. But how is this possible? The main reason for this was poor OPSEC. OPSEC, or Operational Security, simply put, refers to the rules and procedures that one must follow to avoid getting caught when executing some kind of operation, such as running a darknet market. Even with Tor's strong anonymity features, mistakes in OPSEC, such as reusing usernames, leaving identity details in messages, or logging in from traceable locations, can expose users' identities. These small lapses allow law enforcement agencies to piece together clues, leading to the downfall of many dark market operators who believe Tor alone would keep them hidden. It's been called eBay for illegal drugs, a network of relatively... A historical example of this would include Ross Ulbricht, aka Dread Pirate Roberts, the former creator and sysadmin of Silk Road, one of the most infamous dark markets in history. 
Ross Ulbricht not only told his girlfriend about his whole operation, but he also used the same username, Altoid, to promote Silk Road on both a clearnet public forum as well as some forums on the dark web. In one significant mistake, he actually included his personal email address, which contained his real name, rossolbricht at gmail.com. This allowed the feds to link the Altoid persona directly to him, bridging his online identity with his real-world identity, which contributed to his eventual identification and arrest. At the time of his arrest, his laptop was open, unencrypted, and logged into the Silk Road administrator account as Dread Pirate Roberts. This was a key element in the arrest operation. The FBI agents specifically waited until he was actively using his laptop to prevent him from closing it or encrypting it, ensuring they could get access to all of his content immediately. He wasn't caught because of the Tor protocol. The feds basically worked around Tor because it was too difficult to deal with. Rather, they collected all of his human OPSEC mistakes, showed up in person, and grabbed him. This is an example of how a single huge target stood out and got caught, but what about all the users of the dark market? It's not like the feds can spend that much energy on each individual person, right? Well, they don't have to. It's too difficult to break the actual Tor protocol or really deal with it at all, but if you happen to control the destination of the traffic, for example, you have administrative access over the actual dark market where people are buying the illicit goods from, it becomes trivial to track down the users so long as they are sending identifiable information. This is exactly what happened to Hansa Market, a dark market that was secretly taken over by Dutch authorities. In 2017, Dutch authorities seized control of Hansa Market and took over its servers after arresting the sysadmin who had made OPSEC mistakes similar to Dread Pirate Roberts. The feds posed as the dark market admins and actually operated the market for about a month in collaboration with Europol. During this time, they gathered information on both the users and the suppliers, including transaction records and shipping details. The aftermath of this resulted in tracking down and arresting several high-profile Hansa market suppliers involved in large-scale drug trafficking and other illegal operations. Although the Hansa market buyers were generally pursued less aggressively than the suppliers, some were identified, investigated, and in some cases, arrested, particularly if they were involved in high-volume purchases or involved in reselling large amounts of illegal products but everyone that was involved was no doubt put on a list. There are countless instances of illegal activities involving Tor and dark markets that resulted in people getting arrested, or worse. Does that mean Tor is considered exclusively for criminals and you'll be put on a list just for using it? Well, not exactly. Tor can generally be safe to use and will provide some anonymity, assuming you are using secure browsing settings and just practicing good OPSEC in general, as long as you don't engage in illicit transactions or illegal activity, provide personal information, or accidentally view or cache some illegal content onto your system, it's likely nothing will happen to you for simply browsing a dark market out of curiosity. Tor usage actually continues to increase over time as privacy concerns grow, censorship increases in various regions, and people seek safer ways to browse and communicate without tracking or surveillance. While Tor can offer a layer of anonymity, it's not a cloak of invincibility. Using it responsibly, avoiding risky activities, following security best practices, and staying aware of its limits ensure you can safely explore this unique corner of the internet. If you're interested in getting into cybersecurity in the funnest way possible, we created a hands-on CyberInch community where you can practice cybersecurity operations, threat hunting, and vulnerability management in a real cloud-based environment with the option to partake in a technical cyber internship. You'll gain hands-on experience with fully licensed enterprise-grade cybersecurity tools like Tenable, Defender for Endpoint, Microsoft Sentinel, and Microsoft Azure, all in an actual production environment shared with other community members. You'll face both simulated attacks and real-world threats from actual bad actors and malicious bots on the public internet creating a dynamic and authentic learning experience. Like I said, there's an optional cybersecurity internship where you can add actual experience on your resume and LinkedIn from my company, Login Pacific, by completing various vulnerability management and threat hunting related tasks. Numerous interns have landed full-time roles in both IT and cybersecurity. Click the link in the description to learn more about the CyberRange community, full transparency guaranteed. If you like this video, you're gonna love the one about the cybersecurity company who basically brought down the entire world. Click here to watch it now.